All right, so we are going to look at finding cultural capital in the barbershop and beauty salon space. And so when we think about the barbershop and the beauty salon space, uh, what are things that come to mind? Just, just go ahead and say it out loud. Gossip, conversation, uh, debates, what else? News, you know, um, other things like little, little, you know, quirks that happen. Latest hat, okay. So I'm gonna throw out some professionalism, reliability, lateness, tardiness, punctuality, um, you know, having to wait, uh, or this idea of uh, you don't wanna go to this particular barber or this particular stylist, you know, so all those things that you have to navigate. Um, and so both of these spaces have been pretty much mirrored or seen as kind of like church. It's like, you know, equivalent to the black church. Uh, we pretty much have gone there some point in our life or continue to go at some point in our life. I, I am one who has been there pretty much since I could sit in a chair and sit in the, you know, hair ball. And to this day, still, I go to uh, get my hair done. It's kind of like a ritual. It's a therapy. It is a, a much needed outlet for me um, at least once a month. So. All right, so in many ways, the barbershop in the black community is this like discursive space, which uh, the confluence of black hair care for any black people in small talk establish a context for culture exchange. So the barbershop and the hair salon becomes more than just a place to uh, you know, beautify yourself, but it becomes a space to be informed. It is a space for conflict. You get a chance to, uh, you know, have, like you said, debates. You get the idea to learn something. There's activism that's going on. So the, these shops and these spaces become, like I said, much more than the aesthetic itself. And so it's a practice of everyday life, ways of operating or doing things. And if we even look at what the word salon actually means, it has multiple meanings. So a site of hair care and comfort, as well as a constructed community for social and intellectual talk. So uh, both of these spaces become also a rite of passage for both women and men, and also a space of service and information sharing. So as this cultural space, um, and one of the articles that my students read, um, Alexander points out that um, these spaces are cultural spaces, a particular site marked by the cultural practices of the people who live there. These spaces serve as a register of cultural identity, denoting but not delimiting bodies distinguished by race practices and stylistics that signal cultural membership. And so oftentimes these spaces, there is like this honorary membership that you get or that you have when you come into it, um, you know, especially if you're as a, a kid coming in with either your mother, your father, uncle, brother, um, you know, they get to know you, you build this relationship, establish a rapport, they look for you, they expect you to see you, you know, each week or how many ever times you come in. And then there's this communion and kinship that also happens, um, especially when you go in for the first time. So uh, I remember when I first uh, moved to Atlanta and was looking for, and this is, you know, I had kind of like just started my locks or it was in the midst of, you know, probably like halfway through they had my shoulders and I was needing to find a loctician and I was working at Ruby Tuesdays at the time. And there was a, a group of ladies that came in. They were like, well, hey, where do you get your hair done? I said, you know, right now I don't, I don't, I don't have anybody. And they were like, well, here, you know, here's, um, here's our car. We do hair at such, such place. I get there and it was a very welcoming space. It was a very um, space where I was like, wow, because um, if anybody's like me, I don't let just anybody touch my hair. You know, it's, you know, it's a lot of energy up here and I don't want too many people just kind of like digging and touching. And so I, I need someone who's gonna be like dedicated and committed, who's also going to make sure that they treat my hair right. Because it's much more than just going to get it done. You also want somebody that's gonna say, well, you know, I'm noticing this, you know, can we help you out? Let me, you know, let's try this. Or I noticed that, you know, that lineup you had didn't look too right, let me fix that. Or, you know, um, I'm noticing that the dye that they used didn't work. And so um, the space becomes like a, also a way to help, you know, for hair care, not just getting the hair done, but hair care as a whole. And so as these um, spaces, um, you know, what we'll learn is that they also have a historical meaning as far as several of these barbershops and hair salons were actually spaces for um, folks during the civil rights movement to register folks to vote. They were also spaces in which uh, you could learn about health care. And so, like I said, it goes long beyond what we see as just this idea of getting the hair done. You also seek counsel, get direct. How many folks, you know, get some kind of advice 
from whether it's their barber or their, you know, their beautician, whether it's unsolicited or solicited, you know. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, and if you think about it, the same way that you look for a house, look for a job, is the same way that you find a barber, is the same way that you find a hairstylist and, you know, a loctician or, or whichever the case um, may be. So we all, you know, pretty much kind of know this definitely is what happens in these spaces, this idea of social exchange and signifying. And so, you know, definitely you see this playful exchange, rivalry, testing the borders of conversation, creating friendship. There's these private dialogues, you know, trash talk. There's these, they become marked spaces. Um, and then there's this place where, you know, the saying of grown man business or woman's talk. And so um, I know recently where I get my hair done, they've put a sign in where um, as far as uh, kids can't come. And so unless they're getting their hair done, you know, because a lot of stuff is happening, particularly in, at least in my salon. And so maybe they don't necessarily want to have the kids engaging or hearing the language that may be being used or, uh, you know, you don't also want to have to feel like you're limited either um, to having those conversations with your hairdresser. And so sometimes if we see children, you know, we may, uh, you know, curb what we're saying. Some people may, maybe others don't. So that all, all depends. So then I asked the question, what types of conversations are taking place in these spaces? So from you all's experience of those who go or have gone, what is some of the things that you all have engaged with as it relates to these conversations? Yes. So <laughs> Okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And as much as that's problematic, there's like a realness to that, you know, at the same time, because, you know, this is people talking about raising their kids. You know, the language maybe we could have, like, you know, changed up a little bit, but nevertheless, like, they, they talking about how they want their, you know, the kids to turn out, what they want to do, make sure they, they behave or, you know, however. So, yes. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. Yes, yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm hmm mm hmm Exactly. Yep. And like, so with my loctician, uh, this is how long I've been with her. She has uh, four children, and I was there with every, every single one. So she was pregnant each time, and I was there. So, uh, so I had this thing. I had this thing. When she got pregnant the first time, I was like, okay. How do I deal with this? Because I don't—it's not like I have a backup, you know, person to do my hair. And so uh, she said, "Oh, don't worry about it. I'm, I'm going all the way till I can't go no more." And she, literally, I think maybe it was maybe about three weeks out. And then she was like, "All right, I'm gonna be—I'm gonna be gone, but it'll only just be a little while." And for that period of time that she was gone, I did my own hair. I said, you know, because I just couldn't, I didn't—I didn't, didn't want to trust nobody else. And so I was like, "Okay, that's just kid one. She didn't, you know, ain't gonna be no more, you know." Uh, two years later, oh, I guess what, Grace, I'm pregnant again. Like, and you're like, oh, this is great, yay, but dang it, okay, all right, now how do I do this again here? Now my hair is longer, you know, so it's not like it got shorter. Uh, I can't see in the back, you know, it's the, the hair dry, all that, it's, it's a lot. So four kids, I'm there through each one, and it was one of those things. She was like, you stuck with me? I said, yeah, uh, who else was I going to go to? This is, you know, I couldn't find nobody else, so yes. Mm -hmm. And they got to go eat, and then one particular dress, hairdresser we had, like he would play music, and it was a, you know, it was my mom was real old when she was old. 
Okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. Right, and get it done, especially if you have somewhere you got to be, you know. Yes, yes, Chanel. And so this is what you and uh, your uh, stylist will often talk about, or some... Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> and and we're gonna we're gonna get to that idea of when people leave the salon or those who have never been, you know, like what what you know what reasons do people leave or what you know changes um, come up for that to actually happen. So all right. So a historical snapshot. So we've talked about the way that these, um, you know, particularly the beauty shop becomes a place of communal, you know, get, you know, communal kinship, a place of influence, a place to talk and, and learn and all that. But if we look even before all that kind of came to be, we can talk about this idea of particularly in the South, um, beauty salons were the center of communication and influence. It was so, at one point in time, it was a profession which offers a great freedom for leadership and community action, especially if you own the salon. Like, that was your money. You didn't have to work for anybody. That was your space, your time. You got to get um, all of that. And then these were black controlled spaces, independent ones, where they didn't have to be worried about being um, surveilled. Um, by particularly, you know, the surveillance of white supremacists and how uh, the parlors p provided shelter for civil rights organizing. So, you know, when King maybe needed an escape or getaway, you know, he was able, he could come to the barbershop or if, you know, um, Ella Baker needed to, you know, get that, you know, them, that fresh uh, curl set going, she was able to come there also as a relief from, you know, all the campaigning, from all of um, the fighting and action uh, and hostile, hostile environments that they were um, a part of. And so there was also this idea of an autonomy. So with a source of income that came largely from the black community itself, uh, black beauticians were financi financially autonomous and outside of the control of white employers. employers. So that was their money. They got to keep it, hold on to it. It wasn't like they had to give it back or give um, a portion or piece to someone else. And so um, you know, ultimately they become this place for economic opportunity. And so particularly during the 50s and 60s, many black women who were key leaders in the movement also had these similar occupations. So as much as they were, you know, we knew them as these activists, many of them also held uh, jobs as beauticians. So it was like it was, you know, either like a side hustle or um, another way to, um, you know, stay active or be a part of the community. And so we all know, you know, for the most part, beauty and business is a business and it's also therapy. And so there's been this long history of working within the hair industry dating back to the early 20th century. And I've even, you know, seen even early 1800s and 1900s where, you know, they were selling hair care products. So who's usually the first person that we think of when it comes to, you know, the selling of hair care products? Yes. Madam C.J. Walker, so she kind of becomes uh, the front runner as it relates to entrepreneurship, it, as it relates to uh, black hair. Um, also for um, the beauty, the, you know, the hair salon space, it's a very feminized space where, uh, but at the same time, where ordinary people come through. So you don't necessarily have to be the celebrity. You don't have to necessarily be uh, the superstar. You can just be anybody and come into the space that is also very busy at the same time as well. And so, um, you know, these, the beauty salons invoke this notion of pampering, treating oneself, taking time out for oneself, and indulging in um, luxury. Like, you know, like I said, it's one of those things where once a month, you know, I look forward to that mint conditioning, you know, uh, treatment that my loctician puts in, because, you know, it gets all tingling, and you just, just get to sit in that bowl, and it's like, yes, for about 
10 minutes, I mean, you know, I'm in this like second heaven. And so uh, you have to almost in a way tell yourself where, you know, make it seem like it is a luxury. Otherwise, otherwise, you know, people will take that away from you. And, you know, it's not often that we get a chance to uh, pamper ourselves um, when we can and when we want to. And so um, in 2010, um, historian by the name of Tiffany Gill, who is at the University of Texas, Texas, Austin, came out with a book called Beauty Shop Politics, African-American Women's Activism in the Beauty Industry. And in this book, she would talk about how uh, these beauty shops were, you know, a topic basically hiding in plain sight. So we talk about them all the time amongst ourselves, but there wasn't anything really formally written in, you know, this like academic space in which we, you know, to discuss it. And so she takes us back all the way as early as 1820s and discussing how, how black women became, you know, a part of these beauty uh, salons and this beauty industry. So due to black men kind of like being seen as this, like in this dangerous space um, with white women, there was this transition of seeing black women coming in and starting to take care of, um, you know, other women's hair. And so um, as we've kind of seen before, uh, we see this merging of politics and entrepreneurship. And also, even as early as slavery, um, black women were able to make a living, you know, by doing hair. And also, there was this idea of cultivating leadership from within the ranks. And so when people would congregate and come to the shop, there was this um, kind of like organization or organizing of, you know, who's going to run for this position or how can we groom a certain person into um, a particular, uh, you know, either Senate seat or uh, mayor seat or how do we galvanize everybody to make sure that the leadership that we need is being presented. And so, um, as Lori Tharps, who is also kind of a historian who's been talking a lot about black hair, she says, just about everything about a person's identity could be learned by looking at their hair. So yes, that is me and one of my many days of, you know, getting uh, my hair done. I, I, you know, I, um, it's, it's like I said, it's one of those great days when, you know, I go to get my hair done because you go, I go in looking real, it's, it's, not, it's not good, it's, it's rough, it's real rough. I'm, the headscarf is on, everything still. But then I come out like this and it's shining like new money, you know, so. Um, so for black women, hair is an important representation of her identity. Hairstyle, hairstyles are often perceived as facilitating messages to the greater society. And there's also this like common theme with regards to black women and hair. There's this transition or this hair journey, whether it's I'm going to grow my hair out or whether it's going to be I'm going to, you know, make the big chop. Or uh, for me, it wasn't until I turned 30 when I first put color in my hair, you know, for the very first time in my life. And so uh, that was a big thing for me. Like I remember having to like plan and think about it and give myself time because uh, it was something that had never been done. You know, uh, my mother always was like, you know, you don't need no color, just black is fine. But uh, realizing that, you know, well, it's my hair, I want to do something different with it. And um, so thus, you know, we, we get that result there. And also, as it relates to black women's hair, there's all these ways of the, the journey being documented. So now we can see, you know, YouTube, we see hair blogs, we see video blogs, we see, um, you know, Tumblr posts in um, all different forms that are talking about this journey. And so other people can, you know, uh, see how other people have maybe went to decide on making that big shop or whether they decide to get locks or whether they decide to add color. Uh, they also show you ways of like, well, this is how we can make a style. This is how you can, you know, maybe uh, trim your hair. All these different ways that people can be a part of that journey without necessarily having to be in the journey itself. And so um, here we kind of see, um, this is like a marker from Madam C.J. Walker um, to kind of like identify her particular franchise. And so um, the way that women particularly use these were, since they couldn't necessarily have access readily to banks, um, there was like, you know, bank loans would take place in the hair salon. People would be able to, you know, create businesses and become their own entrepreneurs in this space. And so as a result, if we think about as early as Madam C.J. Walker and today, how, you know, how much do you all think, you know, black hair care is worth, you know, to date? Billion. You know, almost, almost a billion. Basically, we're talking about uh, 900 million, you know, to date. And that's, I'm sure, rising. So uh, there's a lot of money that has been made and continues to be made um, in black hair care. And, you know, you would also definitely see other ads um, like these here 
where um, according to um, Dr. Um, Tiffany Gill, the historian I mentioned earlier, these ads were placed in African-American newspapers by beauticians to help them keep you know, um, them, you know, these enterprises financially stable and to avoid um, being um, put into bankruptcy. And so uh, in many cases also, these ads provided funds to sustain Marcus Garvey's Negro World, uh, A. Philip Randolph's uh, The Messenger, um, newspapers such as the Tulsa Star, and other magazines. So these particular ads became, you know, a way to keep other things financially stable versus just simply uh, advertising um, the business. And also, um, beauty parlors became a way of giving back to the community. And um, definitely within the early uh, 50s and even before that, you saw profits from beauty uh, parlors going to black colleges and universities and other institutions like the YMCA. Uh, for example, um, one of the institutions from Madam C.J. Walker, excuse me, would help with the YMCA in about uh, in 1914 to construct the colored um, YMCA building that would exist in Indianapolis, Indiana. So this was um, these funds that they were able to get were able to be given freely to these institutions without having to rely on someone else to build them or give them um, that money. So then, you know, as you know, even though with all the joys and the happiness, there is the cost that come with, you know, this particular space. So many people leave the hair salon space and, you know, this becomes a notion that is very much a factor for black women particularly. And it's due to several reasons such as, as we've all talked about, reliability, professionalism, literally going back to their roots. You know, some people feel as though, you know what, I'm going to, you know, I'm going natural. I don't necessarily need to go to the salon. I can do this myself. Um, also, finding smaller or different spaces for half the cost and time. You know, many of my friends would say, I'm about to go to the Dominicans because they can get it done quick and it's half the price. I don't have to worry about uh, the other, high, uh, other prices. And there's also this feeling of being empowered as far as leaving uh, that particular space. So, yes, that, that's the beauty salon space. So now we're going to transition to a space that uh, I don't really frequent too much, but I hear and talk about it. I've seen it on TV and that would be the barbershop. So uh, I have a video here that I want to show you that kind of like summarizes what this uh, black barbershop or what the black barbershop is. What do you see? Most of you see a barber shop, but I see an opportunity. An opportunity for health. An opportunity for health equity. For black men, the barber shop is not just a place where you get your hair cut or your beard trimmed. No, it's much more than that. Historically, the barber shop has been a safe haven for black men. It's a place where we go for friendship, solidarity, and solace. It's a place where we go to get away from the stress of the grind of work and sometimes home life. It's a place where we don't have to worry about how we're being perceived by the outside world. It's a place where we don't feel threatened or threatening. It's a place of loyalty and trust. For that reason, it's one of the few places where we can fearlessly be ourselves and just talk. The talk, the shop talk, the conversation, that is the essence of the black barbershop. I can remember going to the barbershop with my dad as a kid. We went to Mr. Mike's barbershop every other Saturday. And like clockwork, the same group of men would be there every time we went, either waiting on their favorite barber or just soaking up the atmosphere. I can remember the jovial greeting that warmly welcomed us every time we went. Hey, Rev, they would say to my dad. He's a local pastor, and they treated him like a celebrity. Hey, young fella, how you doing? They would say to me making me feel just as special. 
I remember the range of the conversations was immense. The men would talk about politics and sports and music and world news, national news, neighborhood news. There was some talk about women and what it was like to be a black man in America. But many times they also talked about health. The conversations about health were lengthy and deep. The men often recounted their doctor's recommendations to cut salt in their diet, or to eat less fried foods, or to stop smoking, or to reduce stress. They talked about the different ways you could reduce stress, like simplifying one's love life. <laughs> all ways to treat high blood pressure. There's a lot of talk about high blood pressure in the barbershop. That's because almost 40% of black men have it. That means that almost every single black man either has high blood pressure or knows a black man who has it. Sometimes those conversations in the barbershop would be about what happens when high blood pressure is not adequately addressed. Say, did you hear about Jimmy? He had a stroke. Did you hear about Eddie? He died last week. Massive heart attack. He was 50. More black men die from high blood pressure than from anything else, even though decades of medical wisdom and science have demonstrated that death from high blood pressure can be prevented with timely diagnosis and appropriate treatment. So why is high blood pressure so differentially deadly for black men? Because too often, high blood pressure is either untreated or undertreated in black men, in part because of our lower engagement with the primary health care system. Black men, in particular those with high blood pressure, are less likely to have a primary care doctor than other groups. But why? Some of our earliest research on black men's health revealed that for many, the doctor's office is associated with fear, mistrust, disrespect, and unnecessary unpleasantness. The doctor's office is only a place that you go when you don't feel well. And when you do go, you might wait for hours only to get the runaround and to be evaluated by a stoic figure in a white coat who only has 10 minutes to give you and who doesn't value the talk. So it's no wonder that some men don't want to be bothered and skip going to the doctor altogether, especially if they feel fine. But herein lays the problem you can feel just fine while high blood pressure ravages your most vital organs. This is Denny Moe, owner of Denny Moe's Superstar Barbershop in Harlem. I've been lucky enough to have Denny as my barber for the last eight years. He said to me once, hey doc, you know, lots of black men trust their barbers more than they trust their doctors. This was stunning to me at first, but not so much when you think about it. Black men have been with their current barbers on average as long as I've been with Denny, about eight years. And black men see their barbers about every two weeks. Not only do you trust your barber with your look and with your style, but you also trust him with your secrets and sometimes your life. Denny, like many barbers, is more than just an artist, a businessman, and confidant. He's a leader and a passionate advocate for the well-being of his community. The very first time I walked into Denny Moe's shop, he wasn't just cutting hair. He was also orchestrating a voter registration drive to give a voice to his customers and his community. So that's kind of like, you know, in many ways kind of mirrors also what uh, the beauty salon does, but even um, in current day in within the barbershop space. So. Right. 
So yes, a haircut and a healing. And so um, in many cases, kind of what we would hear in the TED Talk and what many of you all may know and experience uh, yourself, you know, men enter the barbershop for a plethora of reasons and sometimes a haircut is the least of them. Um, it's a space to be granted some semblance of selfhood and humanity to uh, seek a form of beauty, whether physical or one's inner self. And so, you know, there's this warmth that is definitely and sometimes many times desperately yearned for and identity unless afforded to the barbershop is how intimate and vulnerable of a place that it can be. You know, the hiss of the clippers, the clicks, you know, um, the, as it clicks on your head, how your head becomes this canvas. And in many ways, the barber becomes the sculptor and also becomes the counselor. And so um, if you think about it, maybe he cradles your head like so, fading your sides with a hus hushed confidence, or maybe he tilts your chin upward, lining your beard and going about his, about his kids, talking about his kids, and the importance of being there for people when they need you. If barbering is a kind of art, then the relationship the barber has to his artwork, the client, is defined by these moments of tenderness and also genuinely a knowing trust. And so um, in, in uh, this article that I was reading, uh, one of the gentlemen would say, in a lot of ways, barbers are our therapists. The shop is where I learned what being a black man was about early on. But also, at the same time, this place, uh, you know, the barbershop becomes a place of contention. And so um, in my preparation of putting this together, I definitely asked several folks who go to the barbershop, definitely because, as I said, it's not a space that I've gone to, so I can't speak on it as far as personal experience, but I can ask and, you know, get others' opinions so that that can kind of like offer a sense of what this space is about. And so uh, many have said the, the regressive politics about sexuality or gender, it sometimes harbors. The black barbershop has remained, excuse me, remained a space of pride, community, and reflection across generations, much in the same way that the black church has. But also, the barbershop becomes more than, you know, the beauty salon, how it houses several resolved and unresolved themes, which include exclusion and inclusion, gender, race, and sexuality, finding one's identity, this idea of contact, this idea of a sanctioned trust, or these levels of comfort and discomfort. And so as Stuart Hall would say, the domestic is political and the political is gendered. And very much so, um, the barbershop is definitely, uh, you know, from what has been told and, you know, uh, seen to me, you know, very much that. And so um, in many ways, folks go to the barbershop to find the sense of belonging and sometimes are not able to get it due to, uh, you know, feelings of not able to be who they are, be true to themselves. There's also a hyper-masculinity that is often portrayed within barbershops that maybe not everyone fits into that particular category. And some feel as though either I um, want to be who I am or either I hide that and, you know, uh, propose myself as someone else or um, I just, you know, get by through this particular process or this place of where I'm going. So um, no matter what black neighborhood you go to, any black neighborhood, you're going to find two things. And, you know, I would say three, you know, definitely the church, the barbershop and the salon. And with the barbershop in particular for black males, it is just about as sacred as it is the church. It's one of the only safe spaces um, for black men today where they can talk about the politics and speak openly. And for some, even that speaking openly doesn't always um, fit in that category for them. But this also, um, these same black men sometimes don't necessarily realize the spaces, uh, you know, or the people that are in these spaces. And so conversations are had, not necessarily knowing the full dynamics of who's in the space. Some care, some don't. Um, but it's something that definitely is worth being acknowledged and recognized as far as um, the space in itself. Also, so the barbershop and also um, definitely, I would say much more than the, uh, the beauty salon, so to speak, is this rite of passage for young boys. And so oftentimes you see there's this father and son bonding time. There's a lot of mentorship that takes place and just in general, a lot of building relationships that are happening. Um, this place also becomes a place that men can do this self-care, can have this self-expression. Um, there's also, as we would see in the earlier video there, this local celebrity status. 
You know, oftentimes, you know, folks might, you know, have this barber, they go off to college and then they come back and, you know, if the barber is still there, they're like, oh, you know, Johnny's come back. What you, how school been? You know, I know you've been doing this, that, and other. And so you, you know, for even this brief moment, get a chance to have a little bit of a celebrity status when you go. And for many, um, the barbershop becomes this place for teaching young boys how to and how not to behave during their formative years. And so um, as someone had mentioned to me, early on for them at the barbershop was a place where they sat, watched cartoons, played games, traded Pokemon cards with other kids. And at, at an older age, you could get condoms. And it was a place to encourage positive sexual health and ultimately learn from an early age how to carry yourself as a man. So then, you know, as we have, you know, engaged in the barbershop space, in the beauty salon, hair salon space, who gets to be in these spaces, whether it is the barbershop or the salon? Who does get to be in these spaces? Should everybody or is there a, you know, relegated space for uh, who belongs and doesn't necessarily belong? Anybody here? Yes. Mm -hmm. And I just, I go out an awful lot of reviews and stage shows and go into different places. And like that, I ended up basically called down when I was outside the perimeter of the window. Mm -hmm. And it's so weird walking in there. Like, the energy is just like very not like for women. Like, the one woman that, that is in there, she does, she feels a lot like she's not sexualized in any way. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm mm hmm mm hmm Right, right. Okay, okay. Sasha, yes. Okay, mm hmm mm hmm Mm-hmm. Okay. Yes. Mm-hmm. 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 Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
uh, Mr. Uh, Marley and then Miss Terry. I definitely heard that argument, yes. Uh, Ms. Terry and Ms. Pearson. Mm-hmm. Okay. So it's like a protecting in a way? Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. True, yes. I'm going to get to you, Ms. Pierce. I just want to uh, add something to Ms. Terry's thought. Um, I will say that I feel like um, in the hair salon space, it is becoming a bit more flexible, more open. So particularly if you go to like a natural hair shop. So it's always going to, it's a mix, you know, men and women are getting their hair done, they're getting their locks retwisted. And so in, in that space, it's not really contingent. If anything, it's a very, you know, playful environment. Every, you know, everybody's talking, to, nobody feels uncomfortable in that space. But I, I think that's a part of the growing into, you know, certain spaces where both you see men and women in that same hair space. But um, that's also not to say that, you know, barbershops need to transition over and just, you know, allow anybody, you know, anybody or, you know, disrupt that space. Because in many ways that is um, a sacred and safe space that I can respect and I can understand that. You know, um, men have, I mean, women have the hair salon, the nail shop, you know, their home, the kitchen, and everywhere else. So, uh, you know, why not, you know, have at least that, that individual space? So, Ms. Pearson. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like the Better Business Bill, yeah. Yeah. And I think it's, you know, it's an evolving, you know, of the space. Like, you know, every space is going to be different. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I'm going to get a male voice in here. Mr. Bruton, yes. Right. 
Right. Okay. And this was in Atlanta University Center. So the bottles there were very eager to show that they could set a woman's head. Mm-hmm. So you could kind of see each, every time you went in there, one of them was very eager to show you, I can set your head up, and then they'd brag about how good she looked when she left my chair. Mm-hmm. So I'm seeing something different. A shift, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mhm. And you know, and even that, like it all, you know, depending upon where you go and the space that you're in, you're definitely going to um, see like different attitudes and different perceptions. I'm gonna get one more, Mr. Bryant. Yes. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's important to, you know, like you said, acknowledge and recognize, um, recognize that because when we're already in an environment in society where, um, you know, our humanity is always in question, or that we can't have a space to just like be, you know, be ourselves, have our own, be in our own thoughts. Um, it's important to have these these long-standing institutions, um, and it's not like uh, Black folks have that many that are existing and still remaining. So it's important that these institutions uh, still stand, you know, in the, in the literal sense uh, and you know, metaphorical sense, um, because it's it's a part of who we are. It's a part of, you know, um, our standing as, you know, human beings in this society. So, all right. So to kind of shake it up, you know, as we, you know, come around the corner here, uh, definitely the interpretation of barbershops within popular culture. So this is a pop culture class also. So we got to, you know, incorporate the ways that they're being uh, personified. So one in particular was um, the Atlanta episode, which I believe was made about two weeks ago. And um, I, I swear, 
all my male friends, I called them up after this episode, and I was like, please, is this, is there any, like, truth to this? Is there any reality? Is this, you know, outside of, you know, and if you haven't seen it, I'm, you know, spoilers. So, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's been two weeks, you, you know, come on now. Um, <laughs> so, what did, I, I, did, I think I gave it a week for Black Panther, maybe. Uh, so, you know, there's several things where, like, I'm not leaving the, you know, my hair shop to go re- travel with my lactician around the city. You know, it's not, it's not happening. Like, if you have an appointment, I came for my appointment at 3 o'clock, and we're not leaving nowhere to go pick up some lumber, steal some chicken, you know, hit, you know, do a drive-by, you know, or not drive-by, but a hit and run. Like, these are things that, you know, just, you know, we just, you just don't do. Or, or go to one of your children's uh, mother's house, and cut their son hair, and then you roll out, you know. So um, that, that particular episode became very um, interesting because a lot of my male friends were like, yeah, like, you know, that whole having that barber and the things that you go through with that barber, you know. Not, ne- not necessarily to the extreme of what, they were, what was going on in that episode, but just the idea of, like, the things that you go through with your barber or even, you know, your, um, your beautician. You know, sometimes I'll be on my way, my lactation, I'm about 15 minutes late. And you be like, man, like, I got somewhere I got the big man. That's not going to be, you know, so. But, you know, if you've been with them, like for mine, I've been with her for 10 years. Like, I, you know, we'll, we'll work through, you know, I'm going to bite my tongue. But, you know, if we're going to get through and, you know, with that episode, you definitely see that um, being presented. Uh, definitely, you know, if we go and even, you know, old school with the coming to America and that particular uh, scene, definitely, you know, a very uh, unique <laughs> experience in the in the barbershop there. Um, and then, you know, some of your more independent films like with Norris Hair Salon and Queen Latifah's uh, Beauty Shop. Um, and then um, one that I don't have uh, up here is, of course, you know, the series the barbershop series with ice cube and Cedric the entertainer and so forth and then you know uh blackish always definitely you know comes through with uh you know these particular episodes so this one in particular definitely touches upon um that experience and so um even outside of your more entertaining you definitely also have the documentaries that come up so uh this one in particular is one i first learned about mm, i said maybe about 10 years ago called the fade and this one, um, Pharrell um, Williams um, and a couple other folks were doing um, the executive producing um, of this particular documentary. And with this one, it's looking at barbershops on different continents, so outside of just the U.S., and looking at that, that experience and how, in many ways, it's the same, you know, um, or sometimes even um, just slightly different. Um, also here, this is a more recent one that um, the trailer uh, premiered at Sundance, I believe in 2016, called uh, The Shape Up, uh, Gay in the Black Barbershop, which really gives a um, up-close and personal look as far as what it means to be uh, gay and going to the barbershop and the experiences that uh, gay men have as it relates you know, historically and even in today with the barbershop experience. Um, and also definitely uh, Chris Rock's Good Hair, which I'm sure many of us, you know, have definitely seen. The poignant scene that I, you know, always sticks out is when there was this young girl who I want to say had to be maybe about four or five, and they were putting a perm in her head. And I think, you know, a part of me just, you know, um, just died because, you know, uh, I was one, I did have, you know, the perm, the relaxer. And, you know, after watching that, I was like, yeah, never again. Like, no. And if I have any children and any girls, no, I, I, can't, I couldn't do it. So... Uh, no, no perm, no. Mm-mm. Um, you know, I, I think I still have some trauma, you know, from from that, you know, with the scabs and all that, yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, and then we see it also in the play form. So this called play called Heritage, you know, looking at the journey of sisters with their hair. So, um, you know, even in it's the real life sense, we definitely get a chance to see it, you know, not, not only in, um, you know, the movies, but definitely in these documentary academic sense and in, you know, books like the one I showed you from um, Tiffany uh, Gill. Um, and so the global impact. So even outside of the U.S., these spaces translate past just getting a haircut. They serve as the community hubs. And so this is one particularly a, a shop in uh, South Africa. 
And, you know, if you look at it, this is very similar to what we would see in a barbershop, you know, here in the U.S. And so um, it's not as though it's really this change up or this, you know, new uh, found space. But it also definitely reflects this coexistence of tradition and modernity. And so here, this is where you have this uh, unisex salon or Afro-European hairdresser. So this was um, outside in uh, Brixton and so uh, London. And then you have, this is in uh, Nigeria. And so you have where the space translates, you know, globally and across, um, you know, borders. And so, uh, you know, it gives some hope that if, you know, let's say if you ever want to live outside, you do know that there are places uh, where you could potentially feel comfortable enough getting, you know, your hair done. So um, with that being said, um, like I said, the space is very much um, one of those where um, you learn, you grow, you get something out of it, uh, whether you have these long standing relationships, you know, you might get information from folks that you never anticipated you would get, you know, going to uh, the barbershop and to the hair salon. You might even get a chance to, to vote, register to vote if you didn't before. Uh, you can talk that politics and you can, you know, hopefully feel the space. Um, where it is safe. Um, if nothing else, that's what these spaces should be and that capital that you get out of being safe and having your own, um, you know, place to, to be who you are and also to, you know, make a living. You know, there are people who have done this, as many of you all have said, parents, you know, over 30 years, you know, being able to um, own and operate and feel like they have um, a sense of ownership, a sense of honor that uh, comes from that. So moving beyond this space, you know, hair salons and barbershops, despite the hills and valleys, still remain a multifunctional space. One's intention may to be to get a lineup or lock maintenance, but he or she may also leave with an engagement of community activism, an opportunity to register to vote, discuss health activism, and even domestic violence prevention. Um, and if nothing else, it is a full body experience, and I would even add, you know, a mental and spiritual experience at the same time as well. So um, if nothing else, we can all, you know, at least agree that uh, there is some capital to be gained in these spaces, whether we go or whether we own it, um, and that it is vital that they exist and continue to exist. So any thoughts from anybody? Yes, Mr. Thomas. Mm. Mm. Right. Mm hmm. Right. Mm hmm Mm hmm Mm hmm Hmm, interesting. And that's a conversation that I don't really hear too much, you know, about because I'm, I'm hearing more so it's always like the safe haven space. So um, it is good to know, to as far as the balance that, you know, there is many different dynamics that go into how we interpret and feel about the space. Uh, yes, Ms. Johnson. Mm hmm. That's interesting, that's significant, you know, um, because like you said, with that something not existing before, maybe that might translate onto other campuses or just in other places to feel like maybe, you know, we can, you know, add this. Because I remember going to school in the AUC, you know, folks couldn't travel that far to get their hair done. So to be able to have something close by, if anything, is strategic, if nothing else, too, because that way people don't have to travel far to get something that, you know, especially if they wanted to make, uh, maintain um, their hair. Yes. Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Right, right. Mm -hmm. To go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in some spaces, you're beginning to see, like, the blending of the two. So you'll have barbers in a natural hair salon so that people don't have to, like, go and find another, you know, you know uh, a barber to do or to find the loctician. So it becomes easy. You know, because you get the line up and then, you know, two chairs down, you can go and get your hair, um, you know, retwisted. So it becomes um, feasible, you know, if anything. So, yes. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm hmm Right. And it could be, you know, a regional thing, you know, as well also too. So Mm hmm. Um, it's really in the Mystery. Yes. <laughs> mm hmm. Mm hmm. Right. Right. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm Right, right, yeah. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, we could say, you know, uh, my grandmother was my first, you know, beautician with the hot comb on the stove, you know. So, uh, oh, bless the trauma, trauma, still trauma, you know. <laughs> but uh, them kitchens, that's right. <laughs> Yeah, you got to hold the ear, hold the ear, yep. <laughs> yeah, we didn't have that one. Mm-mm, still scares me. Yep. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Miss <laughs> Terry. Right. 
Right. And, you know, you're speaking as far as, like, um, people, like, doing it in their home. Uh, I remember talking about this before to some of my other students, and uh, they were mentioning how, you know, like the barbershop for particularly black men was a space that some could get a job where they couldn't get one anywhere else. And so, you know, if you think about how important not even just actually going to it, but, like, those who participate in actually, you know, doing the, the, the cutting of the hair. And so... It's, you know, it's a kind of like cyclical, you know, effect as far as the people getting their hair done get to benefit. Those who are cutting the hair get to benefit. And, you know, um, it, it's just, it's in a way kind of it can be seen as a win-win um, when you put it together also. Miss um, uh, Chambliss and Miss Pearson. Oh, I was going to say, um, I was thinking about Walmart Hotline. Mm-hmm. 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 Mm-hmm.